So mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell, right? I mean, it's pretty much a meme at this point. More accurately, they extract energy from our food and give it to us as ATP, but they're important, these little guys, these mitochondria, these little jelly beans in the cell. But they're different. They're different than the other organelles inside of our cells. And this led to a really interesting theory that basically they're aliens. Keep watching. All right, so maybe aliens is a bit of a stretch, but bacteria. Bacteria is where people think that mitochondria came from, that they're actually ancient bacteria. And this theory is one of those that's just so wacky that you think there's no way it could be true. I mean, I'm still trying to kind of accept that there are more bacterial cells on me and inside of me than there are my own cells. But inside my cells? Really? Are you serious? Well, let's take a little closer look. So this theory is known as endosymbiosis theory. Let's break that word down a little bit. Should be familiar with bio, means life, got it. Sim is together and endo is inside. Actually, this sounds a lot like endocytosis, which you'll learn about in a later chapter, but basically that's how a cell surrounds something in a membrane and basically swallows it inside. And that's how the theory goes, that an ancient cell, this kind of pre-eukaryotic cell, swallowed a bacterium that became mitochondria. This theory was developed by Lynn Margulis um, back in the 1960s. She's an interesting scientist. Just a little bit about it because she's just so cool. If you ever have to do a report on a scientist, I would seriously consider Lynn Margulis. Interesting life, total rebel. And I know, you, you kind of look at me and you think, yeah, he's a rebel. I am. But uh, she just always was bucking the system. I mean, had lots of controversial ideas throughout her life. Um, even though she's an evolutionary biologist, she kind of rejected what we call neo-Darwinism, the idea that natural selection explains uh, a really a lot of the diversity that we see around us. And she said, really, symbiosis, kind of lives merging, she thought was more important. And that idea that there are three major domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, she rejected that one. She said, no, I still like the five kingdom system better, and here's why. So, um, you know, this kind of brings up this idea that it's good to have some healthy debate and disagreement among scientists. It keeps us honest about our theories. And people did not like hers at first. So she wrote a paper about this in 1966. It was rejected by, count them, 15 journals until one finally accepted it and published it. Now is this kind of landmark paper that people look back to and say, how could we have missed that? Maybe she was a little ahead of her time. Well, here's the fingernail sketch of this theory. Way before humans existed, we still just had single-celled life. And it was becoming more complex. Most living things were still bacteria. But we're developing something that looked like a eukaryotic cell. And it goes around and gobbles things up. It's probably a bit like an amoeba, you know, surrounding cells and gobbling them up. And it gobbled up one, uh, one day and Instead of merging it with like a little lysosome to digest it and break it up and, and use it for energy and spare parts, it said, you know, little guy, you're so cute and you're so good at producing ATP and I'm so bad at it, I think I'll keep you around. And that formed the symbiotic relationship. And people actually also think this happened with chloroplasts as well, not just mitochondria. But mitochondria are kind of our focus, so we'll stick with them. Swallowed up, held it captive, and basically formed this relationship where both parties benefited. Sounds pretty crazy, doesn't it? Told you it did. Well, let's take a look at some of the evidence that supports this theory and why people have kind of been won over by it now, even though 15 journals rejected it at first.
All right, so quick summary of the theory again, that both mitochondria and chloroplasts, you can see them pictured over here, over time were basically captured by eukaryotic cells, and there you go. Just to take a, a little closer look at that, we can even start right around here. The first cell we might call something like a eukaryotic cell. You can see it has a nucleus and some rough endoplasmic reticulum, stuff like that. And this bacterium got engulfed by it. And then it just kind of camped out there, happy for the rest of its existence. Well, why do people even think this is true? Unlike the other organelles, mitochondria have their own DNA. It's in a big loop, just like bacterial DNA, instead of long strands like ours of chromosomes. And with that DNA, of course, they can make their own proteins, and they have their own ribosomes. Not only that, the ribosomes look like bacteria ribosomes. There's actually a slight difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic ribosomes. Well, these look like the prokaryotic ribosomes. When the cell divides by mitosis, mitochondria will divide as well, but they divide kind of on their own by binary fission, which is exactly the same way bacteria reproduce. And then there's some other technical ones that are a bit beyond us, but basically some of the proteins in the membranes and such have similarities to only bacterial proteins. And some of the chloroplasts even still have a cell wall made of peptidoglycan, just like bacteria. That's a lot of evidence. When you start looking at that, you think, maybe this is a little less crazy than I thought at first. Well, not every symbiosis is a perfect harmonious relationship. Once cells took up these bacteria and kept them captive inside, then this relationship formed that I'm not quite sure how to look at it. I mean, you could look at these as kind of live-in slaves or butlers or Maybe they're taking advantage of the cell themselves. But here's what I see each side gets out of it. The bacteria, which we now call mitochondria, have a safe place to live. They're not out here anymore. They have a nice, stable home. And this cell's kind of end of the bargain is to say, tell you what, I will give you guys food and oxygen. I'll supply all you need. What does the cell get out of it? it gets more ATP than it could imagine. Because on its own, without the mitochondria in here, for every glucose molecule it takes in with its own enzymes, it can only make two ATP molecules. That's a pretty lame return, two. Whereas if you were to give mitochondria a glucose molecule, it could crank out 36. Well, now you see why the appeal of this relationship. So as long as this cell holds it, it's into the bargain, gives it food and oxygen, then the mitochondria return a whole bunch of ATP. If the cell does not hold up, it's into the bargain, usually when it lets oxygen levels run low, then the mitochondria go on strike and stop working and said, you can make your own ATP. That's how the deal was struck. I hope you found this story as fascinating as I do. I, I, it's almost sci-fi. It's just too good to be true. Uh, but it just shows life is pretty awesome, isn't it?